Canadians are flocking to clinics and pharmacies to get their COVID-19 vaccines, but some may be hesitant or even reluctant because they're still just not sure about the science. With us now to help clear up lingering questions about the safety and reliability of these new vaccines, in Bethesda, Maryland, Dr. Nicole Lurie, primary care physician and director of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations in the United States. And Dr. Lurie, we're delighted to have you on TVO tonight. How's things by you right now? It's great to be with you. Things are great. I think at least in the U.S. we're making good progress on the vaccine confidence issues, although obviously there's a good way still to go. Indeed. Well, I wanted to start actually with where you are right now. You're just in the in the shadow of Washington, D.C. What's uptake been like in D.C. as it relates to the vaccines on option? Well, I think uptake continues to be steady, as I think has been the case just about everywhere. People who are uh, better educated uh, and largely uh, people who are uh, white uh, have gotten themselves vaccinated long before other populations. But we're really starting to see much more spread of vaccination across all income groups and across all race and ethnic groups. One piece of that that's been more difficult, I think, has still been in rural areas. But I think as we're getting more and more experience with the vaccine, people are becoming more confident. Well, let me hit the race area first, because, of course, Washington, D.C. is 90 plus percent African-American. And if there is vaccine hesitancy in that community, what different approaches do you need to take in order to ensure a better uptake? Well, I, I think we've really all come to understand that we need to meet people where they are. And, you know, I practice medicine actually in a community clinic in D.C. And so I work with a very diverse population all the time. And I think what's really important to understand is that different populations have really different kinds of concerns and everybody's got a lot of questions. And so lecturing at people and saying, hey, this vaccine is safe is not a very workable proposition, but talking to people about what are their worries and concerns and taking the time to answer their questions is really, really important. It's also critical for them to hear from people they know and people they trust. Again, not lecturing, but listening and explaining. It's interesting that you say not not lecturing and not sort of berating people to take the vaccine. And I mean, not just on social media, but I see plenty of it actually in just regular everyday life where, you know, somebody might be walking by the sidewalk without a mask on and they get upbraided. Um, mm-hmm. How do we get around that? I mean, the reality is there are a lot of people who are angry right now when they hear about people who don't want to take vaccines. I see right now in the elementary schools of the province I'm coming to you from, the average uptake is 70%. Among teachers, it's 40%. Um, how, if, if, if sort of beating people over the head isn't the way to do it, what's a better way? Well, I think understanding what the reasons are that people feel hesitant is really, really important. And I can tell you just from talking to my patients, I hear lots of different things. So I hear the most common thing, this was developed so fast, I think they cut corners. And as somebody who's been involved in vaccine development for a long time, one of the things that I share with them is that although it seems as though the mRNA vaccines, for example, were developed in under a year, and that's the the story we tell each other in the voice track, that in fact, we've been working on mRNA vaccines for over a decade. And it's taken well over a decade of investment to test the different ways to make them, to test their safety, to test the lipids they've been in, to really optimize things for us to feel ready to go with them. And that the goal of them was ultimately that we could have what we would call a platform or a cassette that you could sort of plug and play if a new bug showed up. And it's only now that this was possible. If this pandemic had happened five years ago or even three years ago, we would not have been able to do this. So when people hear that and then get walked through, for example, the testing process, that's pretty helpful. And when you can share with people now that the number of hundreds of millions of people who have now gotten vaccine right around the country and around the world, I mean, that's really, really impressive. And 
just be really forthright with them about what we know and what we still don't know. Let me follow up with you on this issue of uh, the vaccines being developed, quote unquote, at warp speed. And here's something from the Journal of American Medicine that came out last year. For scientists and physicians, the term warp speed should trigger concern. Good science requires rigor, discipline, and deliberate caution. Any medical therapy approved for public use in the absence of extensive safeguards has the potential to cause harm, not only for COVID-19 prevention efforts and vaccine recipients, but also for public trust in vaccination efforts worldwide. That was an admonition put on the record about a year ago. Uh, I take your point, what you just said about why things were developed so quickly, but let's hit this right on the head. Do you think there are any shortcuts taken in the development of the vaccines? Well, I can talk to you about the shortcuts um, pretty easily. I don't think there were any real shortcuts. The vaccines went through animal testing. They went through phase one. They went through phase two. They went through extensive uh, phase three testing, you know, in up to 40,000 people in randomized trials. And they've continued to undergo testing and evaluation post authorization with real world evidence. So from those perspectives, I don't think there was any shortcut taken at all. I think what did happen, and it was because everybody was going fast, were two things. One is that some of the required animal testing that had been done repeatedly with a given vaccine platform in the past was allowed to be done in parallel with the phase one tests instead of do the animal tests, wait six months, you know, or wait for whatever, and then start the phase one testing. So the regulators, because they were familiar enough with using mRNA vaccines experimentally for other diseases, allowed some of that to go forward. And that really helped to speed up the process. So I don't think that was a shortcut at all, but I think it helped to speed up the process. The other thing that happened is that we started manufacturing vaccines before we even knew they were gonna work because we knew that the demand for vaccine would be really great uh, afterwards. But we were totally prepared to throw them away if they didn't work. And in fact, I think the whole world was a little surprised and caught off guard by the number of these things that worked and worked well. All right, let me follow that up with, with this. We know who the sort of big names in the manufacturing side of this are. You know, the Johnson & Johnson, the Pfizer's, Moderna's, AstraZeneca's, and so on. Are there still major drug manufacturers that are working on vaccines that have yet to get a product to the market, but may yet still do so? Oh, absolutely there are. There are overall something like 200 candidates in development. And there are a whole number of them now that are either in phase two or still in phase three trials. Uh, some of those in phase three trials have already reported interim results, for example, Novavax. Uh, some have reported, I think just yesterday, the day before, CureVac announced that it had preliminary results. And so we're going to expect to see those hit the market pretty quickly. And behind them are a whole series of vaccines, including what we might call wave two or second generation vaccines that might down the road turn out to have some attributes that make them more desirable than the current vaccines. For example, being uh, stable at normal refrigeration. And why do you think it has taken longer for these other companies to get their product to market than the four I mentioned off the top? Well, some of them had some early missteps, to be really honest, and so had to backtrack. You know, vaccine development is a risky business. It typically takes about nine starts to get to a successful vaccine. And delightfully, that hasn't really been the case, but some of them had some early missteps. Some didn't work and we don't hear about those at all. Right. Um, some didn't have the required funding and some just were slow or started late or did other sorts of things. And now it's getting harder and harder, as you can imagine, to set up a randomized controlled trial because vaccines are available in many places around the world. And it's not really ethical to do a trial now giving pl people a placebo in many parts of the world. Hmm. I should ask you as well about some of the incentives that some political leaders are offering in order to get people to be open to taking the vaccine who might have been hesitant in the past. 
Uh, you see things like uh, they're offering lottery tickets, or I think the governor of New Jersey is actually paying people, paying younger people to go get the vaccine. Does that, generally speaking, that approach, does that work? So let me work through the telephone here, and I'm sorry about that. So I think what I would say is, you know, the biggest incentives, gosh, apologies, the biggest okay. incentives are to meet people where they are and make it easy for them to get vaccine. Okay. We know a lot now about human behavior. We know about behavioral economics. We know that everything that we can do to sort of nudge somebody toward vaccine is probably good, not only for them, but for the community around them. And so there's a lot of debate over the incentives. It's going to be really interesting to see and understand better which ones work. But we're all really focused now on achieving as high a population coverage as we can because it's going to help people stay healthy. It's going to take the burden off the healthcare system. It's going to help economies recover. And it's going to help as variants emerge to be protected as a society from those new variants. We totally get that you are a person in demand. So if the phone rings, that's fine. We'll, we'll just keep plowing forward. That's no trouble there. Uh, okay, I want to put another semi-controversial issue on the table for you to talk about as well, and that is the issue around the AstraZeneca shots in a very small number of people that caused blood clots. And obviously that suggests there is a risk in taking the AstraZeneca shot. There is also a risk in not taking the AstraZeneca shot because you could get COVID if you don't take it. Balance those risks for us and tell us which is the bigger risk? You know, it's a really great question. And I think it depends a lot on who you are and it depends on what's going on in your community. So it has been the case that in most places, the risk of getting COVID and hence the risk of either getting blood clots or dying from COVID is much, much, much higher than the risk of getting uh, one of these very rare side effects from the vaccine. And by the way, I think we're getting better now at understanding, coming to an understanding of what those side effects, of what's causing those side effects. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do something about it. But what I would say is if transmission is still pretty high and if the population coverage in your community is still pretty low, get a shot and be protected. It is a much better uh, risk to do that than to be concerned about what has turned out to be a very rare side effect. If we get to a point down the road, and I think it's still way down the road, and it's pretty far down the road for Canada, uh, where most of the population is covered and there's not that much disease circulating anymore, then the calculus is really different. I think we know right now that the risk benefit ratio for just about all populations, except for perhaps younger women, is really, really favorable for getting the vaccine and for AstraZeneca. And fortunately in Canada, as well as in the US, um, there, are, there are also choices that people have. Well, that does raise the, the next world, issue. I will just say, the rest of the world doesn't have that choice. In the rest right. of the world, in, in South America and Latin America and India and parts of Africa, this thing is taking off like wildfire. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, there is no question by any stretch of the imagination that you will save far, far, far more lives with getting vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine or any vaccine for that matter right now that's on the market than you will from worrying about an extremely rare side effect. Okay, that makes sense. So cir cir circumstances do matter and I, I, we understand that now. But you did raise another issue there that I should follow up on and that is the age at which the vaccine works. Do we assume that it's okay regardless of how old you are? So what we know now is that the mRNA vaccines have been studied down to the age of 12. The J&J &J vaccine is in trials down that low and the mRNA vaccines are also now in trials from infancy or age two up. They've now got emergency clearance for age 12 and up and we know the vaccines work really well. In fact, they work just fine. And so we're seeing in high income countries that we're starting to vaccinate uh, teens and pretty soon children. It's a really interesting question about the 
effectiveness or efficiency of doing that from a global point of view, if you've got limited doses and you want to stamp out this pandemic and you want to save lives, you really want those doses to go to the people who are at highest risk of dying or having really bad complications. And those are people who are older and people with chronic disease. But do they work? Yes, quite well. And just to be clear, anybody under 12 at the moment should not take it then? They're not authorized yet for people under the age of 12. Those studies are still ongoing. And we expect that probably early fall, we'll see the results of those. Okay. Uh, you know, you do hear some funny things out there and you're the expert, so I wanna put them to you. Can taking the vaccine change your DNA? You know, it's such a great question. And I get asked this all the time for the obvious reasons that it's really confusing to understand what DNA is and what RNA is. So the messenger RNA has, is not DNA at all. It doesn't even get into the center of the cell, which is where the DNA is. So no, it can't change your DNA. And in fact, the mRNA degrades within a couple of days of being injected. Okay, I'm gonna read something else. This is from Alison Meek, who's an associate professor of history, King's University College in London, Ontario about two hours west of from where I am right now. And here's what Allison Meek says. Pandemics and viruses are scary. People get sick and die. Science, when it's not understood, is itself scary. There's a reason why Frankenstein is a horror story. And the ever-changing nature of decoding viruses suggests to some that even the scientists don't understand what they're looking at. This has been made worse by a public health communication strategy that hasn't been particularly clear. Masks aren't necessary. Wear a mask, wash your food to avoid contamination. Nah, you're good. This is the preferred vaccine. Well, this one is suspended because of a tiny risk of blood clots. Okay, this opens the door to a bunch of questions about the scientific world and how well it has communicated information around COVID-19 and the vaccines, generally speaking. What's your view on that? Well, obviously, everybody could have done a lot better. There's no question about that. And what I would say is we've had a really difficult nexus or intersection of science and politics. And to some extent, this is always the case, but the politicization of all of this, I think has made this much more challenging. I will say as a public health professional, it's your job to make the best decision that you can with the best available science at the time. And when the best available science changes to communicate with the public and to change the advice. So I don't have any problem at all with the fact that advice has changed over time as we've come to know more. What I do have real problems about is the way that that has been explained to the public, the way the public has um, been helped to get ready for that. They should expect that science is the way out of this and we're going to have more answers to questions down the road. And when we do that, we're gonna share them with you and they might provide different answers. And that's a place I think where the politics in particular have really gotten in the way of this. And there's been a really all out effort to really discredit science as a result of that. And that's really unfortunate. Well, that does speak to a lack of science literacy that I think you'd agree is endemic, if I can use that word, uh, maybe a science illiteracy epidemic within the population. I, I, I mean, is that how things like if you get an injection, there's a possibility that a radio transmitter developed by Bill Gates is going to end up in your system and they're going to be able to monitor for you for the rest of your life. Our science illiteracy contributes to that? Well, I think that there's a couple things. One is science illiteracy. One is that the public even has a lot of difficulty figuring out when they see something online or in the newspaper, what's true and what's not true. And in fact, we just saw a study over the past couple of days about the way people really even overestimate their ability to s distinguish real news from fake news. So I'd say science illiteracy is part of that, but we also have to acknowledge that there have been really overt campaigns by conspiracy theorists and by others to discredit or to confuse the public and to discredit science. And some of those have been targeted specifically at different minority groups. So for example, at least in this country, a huge amount of campaign aimed at Hispanic Latina populations to tell them that getting vaccinated will interfere with their fertility, for example, not true. The thing about the microchips, not true. 
And the last thing I would say is that a bunch of this information is coming very clearly and explicitly from country actors that want to disrupt society, that want to seed communication and distrust, or in some cases might have a competitor vaccine that they also want to try to promote. So all of these things come together to really confuse the public. You know, it's interesting. I heard an interview the other day on some radio station somewhere, and it was it took place in the Deep South, your country. I, it was the doctor uh, who had allowed in and the patients had allowed in uh, a, a couple of would-be recipients who had a bunch of questions, uh, and, and they were, you know, reasonably educated, intelligent people. And this was one of the questions that they asked the doctor, you know, is there a radio transmitter tracking device in the needle that I need to be concerned about? And to the doctor's great credit, the doctor didn't call them idiots, didn't, uh, you know, didn't take that approach at all. Very calmly and methodically explained why that was impossible. That's the right approach, I guess, right? That is a terrific approach. And there are two parts about that approach, or three, that are really important. First, the doctor listened to the concerns of people. Secondly, he didn't lecture at them. He explained, right? And he ultimately uh, let them uh, make a choice. And he acknowledged that their concerns were really legitimate and needed to be addressed. What I will say is it's really incredibly time consuming and labor intensive to do that one person at a time or two or three people at a time. And that's why we need lots and lots of different people who various segments of the population trust doing that work at this point. It's hard, tedious, slow work. It's really rewarding. I can tell you that in my own clinic, I might spend 20 minutes talking to somebody about their concerns about vaccination before they feel ready or before they say, I wanna think about this and I'll come back and see you next week. And almost all of them have come back and gotten vaccinated, but that's what it takes. I am curious about your track record though, of the, of the percentage that you take the time to explain and answer all their questions, what percentage do you actually get to take the jab at the end of the day? I would say about 85% take it then hmm. and another 10% come back the next week. I will say when I started doing this back in January as vaccines became available, the overwhelming proportion of my patients or the patients our clinics saw were not remotely ready to get vaccine. And that's changed dramatically over time as they've been able to come in and discuss it face to face with a doctor as they've seen friends and neighbors get vaccinated with no ill effects. And as they've seen more and more people die, including loved ones. Uh, from COVID and they know they don't want that to happen. Yeah, let me pick up on that because, because I mean, this is unprecedented we're what we're going through right now. A vaccine that was developed so quickly and has had so much uptake by so many citizens around the world with so few adverse effects. Has that, I mean, that's evidence. Has that evidence, how far do you think it's gone to convince those who are hesitant that this is something you can do? I think it's gone pretty far. And I think it's helped a ton. I think what I would say is there are some people just really hardcore, no way, no how I'm getting vaccine, uh, period, end of story. I think it's still the minority of people who haven't gotten vaccinated. But I think for that huge group of people in the middle who still have questions and are still hesitant, helping them understand how many people have gotten it and what we know about side effects and adverse events uh, has been really helpful. So in this country, we, we don't have AstraZeneca vaccine. We talk about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and well over 7 million doses have been given. Uh, and I think there are six or seven reported cases of the problem with the brain clot. Um, and so that's not very many when you consider the number of people who would have died without that vaccine. And that is an enormously safe vaccine nothing in, in life is safe completely, right? Your chance of ending up in a killed in a car wreck in your life is one in a hundred. So getting a vaccine is certainly a whole lot safer than that. And you know, now that you raise that, um, boy, <laughs> at the risk of sounding self-indulgent here, let me give you my own example. I've had two shots of AstraZeneca. First mm -hmm. one back in March, second one just a few days ago. First time, knocked me out for the day. Knocked me out, could not get out of bed, could not open my eyes. 
Second time, nothing. Can you explain to people why some people will have the kind of reaction I had? Some people will get a sore arm. Other people get nothing. Other people get blood clots in their uh, clots in their brains, rather. Why such a wide uh, array of different experiences? Sure, and I can answer some of your questions, but not all of them. But first of all, congratulations on getting vaccinated. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, when I got my vaccine, my first one gave me a sore arm. My second one knocked me out for three days. And I tell my patients that. And I say, be prepared for that. A really big deal is if your employer won't give you time off if you're feeling crummy. And that, with our population right now, is a reason that people are still a little worried about, about getting vaccinated. But what happens when you anything foreign comes into your body is that your body tries to fight it off. You have an immune system, and that immune system kicks into gear and starts working. And so you may have a reaction, a local reaction to the vaccine that is from your immune system um, generating that inflammation to fight off what's foreign. And then the more systemic reactions may have to do with the fact that your immune system says, hey, this is a foreign thing. I have to build antibodies against it. So if you feel crummy, get sick, have a low grade fever, even if you're knocked out for three days, it means your immune system is working. And I've never felt so happy to feel sick in my whole life. And I'm gratified that at my age, my immune system is still working well. Um, and you should be similarly gratified, even though you look younger than I do. Um, <laughs> why, it is, why it is that people get the blood clots, I think we still don't understand. And I think there's still more exploration and explanation of that that needs to happen. But we know that it is exceedingly rare. And I don't think it has, we don't think it has to do necessarily with the immune response that makes you feel really crummy like with a COVID vaccine, but it obviously triggers uh, antibodies to platelets in a very, very, very small number of cases. And that sets off a cascade of problems. I can't believe how fast the time has gone by. I literally have 10 seconds left to ask one more question. And that is, there are some people with some medical conditions that ought not to take the vaccine. What are those conditions? You know, it's a great question. I don't know of any medical conditions that should predis that means you shouldn't get the vaccine. For some vaccines, if you have a history of anaphylaxis or really severe allergy, we've seen that with the mRNA vaccines, get a different vaccine. But other or go, you know, with an EpiPen and, and be prepared in case you need it. But that's extremely rare and we haven't seen a ton of that since the beginning. Otherwise, I don't know of anybody with any condition that shouldn't get a vaccine. We looks to be really safe in pregnant women and people who are immunosuppressed or have had transplants. It is safe. They might not generate quite the immune response, and it might turn out that they're going to need a third dose. We don't know that yet, but it's safe. Dr. Nicole Lurie, we thank you so much for spending so much time with us on TVO tonight. We're really grateful. A pleasure to join you. Thanks so much for asking. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.